to you, Devata. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Arnish. Just give me a moment so that I can set up the Facebook Live. Yeah, I think it's working now. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. So as Dr. Avnisha said, we'll be uh, starting the episode fifth today, and we'll be dealing with a couple of uh, very interesting cases on vein occlusion. So on the panel, we have Dr. Ramya. Sorry. So we have Dr. Remya, who is a consultant in Vitreretina at Little Flower Eye Hospital. Then we have Dr. Divyansh, who is working as a consultant in Shankara Hospital, Bangalore. And Dr. Mayang Bansal, who is working as a consultant in Fortis Gurgaon. And uh, uh, for the first speaker, uh, presenter, may I invite Dr. Neha Suhalkar to present her case. Uh, she has her own practice in Kurnool, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, please share your screen. host disabled participants. I'll do that, yeah. Please try now. Good evening, all. Um, you can see my screen, is it? Uh, so today yes. I'll be present a case of a 40 year old male patient who had sudden painless loss of vision in left eye since one day that was in February 2020. He was uh, known hypertensive and he was on regular treatment with amlodipine. He is, uh, gives history of dialysis for chronic kidney disease, uh, secondary to nephrotoxicity using anti-inflammatory drugs. He is in stage five and uh, has chronic interstitial nephritis and accelerated hypertension from past two years and uh, he gets his dialysis done twice a week. So he also gives history of benign prostate hypertrophy and he was on tamsulosin for two years. His presenting uh, visual acuity uncorrected was six by six in right eye and it was counting fingers close to face in left eye. Uh, so this is the only uh, investigation reports which he was holding uh, regarding his kidney status, which was done last in 2018. It is a bilateral contracted kidneys with grade two renal parenchymal changes, uh, left moderate hydroeretronephrosis. Uh, the latest uh, blood investigations, which he got it done uh, was uh, in February, 2020. Before coming to us for serum creatinine, which was at 8.4 milligram per deciliter. His GFR was nine ml per minute and his hemoglobin was seven grams. So this is the clinical picture he presented to us with, uh, where uh, to start with, he, media was really hazy with uh, uh, hyperemic disc and disc edema and uh, multiple uh, intraretinal hemorrhages, uh, including both superficial and lateral blood hemorrhages all over the posterior pole and till, extending till mid, mid uh, peripheral retina. And uh, the veins were uh, engorged, notches and dilated. Uh, and there was a serial uh, retinal artery occlusion. There was retinal whitening, which was observed along with the intraretinal hemorrhage uh, in the area between the disc and the fovea. Uh, fovea was not much made out the reflex. So uh, we made a diagnosis of uh, right eye central retinal vein occlusion with associated celio retinal artery occlusion. Uh, this was an OCT picture at the time of presentation where uh, there was uh, subretinal fluid, uh, intraretinal bleed, and uh, uh, there was also hyperreflectivity of uh, the inner layers, suggestive of uh, some artery occlusion as well. Then uh, patient was not affordable at that point of time, so we went ahead with AC parasynthesis, and then he got back to us for injection on after four days later. Uh, so this is a presentation the day he came back for injection where uh, the disc edema has uh, come down a little bit. The disc looks much better with a little pallor temporarily and the engorgement of veins has also come down and uh, the media was also a bit clear. Uh, at this point of time, couldn't make out much of uh, the vein uh, ciliary artery occlusion in this uh, fundus photograph. But there was indirectly bleed, which looked more of uh, sub -ILM. 
but later the patient uh, was lost for follow up uh, because of lockdown and then he got back to us on 21st uh, of may where he was complaining of diminution of vision in right eye since 10 days and he says he's pretty happy with the left eye and he gave history of blood transfusion which was done 10 days back because his hemoglobin dropped more down to 5, five gram per centimeter. At this point of time his visual activity, desperate visual activity was 6 by 6 in right eye and it was 6, 20, 6 by 24 in the left eye. His blood pressure was 140 by 90 and uh, there was RAPD grade 1 in left eye and the pressures were under control. So we looked into the left eye, uh, uh, it was improving, the tortuosity of vessels, veins has come down, we could see uh, uh, hypertensive uh, retinopathy changes and uh, uh, even hemorrhages are coming down with little paler of the disc. And then I went back and I saw the right eye because he was complaining and there was tortuosity of the vessels, veins especially with dilatation and uh, there were multiple uh, intraretinal hemorrhages which were scattered all over the posterior pole extending to mid-peripheral mid retina in the right eye now. So this was a OCT picture which was done at that point of time where the, there was resolution of uh, edema but there was a little foveal thinning with PZ disruption in the left eye and right eye there were few cystic changes in the intraretinal layers apart from that everything else looked normal so at this point we made it as right eye resolving central retinal vein occlusion with associated cilia or retinal artery occlusion which we he had previously and then we made the left eye acute central retinal vein occlusion right sorry it's reverse so my questions to the panelists Thank you so much, Dr. Neha. Uh, you can stop the screen sharing for the moment. Yeah, we'll, yeah okay, you keep it on. Maybe we'll, we'll need to view the slides. I'll just, yeah. Okay, so I'll take some questions from the panelists, take it one by one. A very nice case where we see that uh, uh, there is bilateral involvement and we are seeing a mixed uh, kind of a case where we are seeing a, an artery occlusion and a vein occlusion as well. So my first question to Dr. Remya is, uh, can you tell us about some causes of uh, causes that can lead to this uh, bilaterality of CRBO? Bilaterality of CRBO mostly, it is the hemodynamic state is very, which is very, very important in all cases. Especially regarding this case, this is an end-stage renal disease patient, I guess. It's a stage 5 kidney disease. So it has been reported that about 95% of the patients with uh, renal disease, especially on dialysis or transplantation, they can go in for central retinal vein occlusion, either unilateral or bilateral. So the hemodynamic parameters of this patient is very, very important, especially in with regard to the anemic status and the serum creatinine and the glomerular filtration rate. Apart from the other factors, the most important uh, risk factors for development of bilateral, uh, uh, this thing is, in an young patient would be protein C, protein S, and all other, uh, the thrombotic factors that you have to evaluate. And also the systemic risk factors like hypertension, which is of much, uh, much importance, in the, especially in this case. Sorry, am I audible? Yeah, yeah you're audible. I think somebody's mic is on. Okay. Yeah. Please and uh, in so uh, basically the hematological factors, which is very very important. Right. Thank you, Doctor Raman. Uh, Can I just uh, comment on this? Sure. Yeah. Please. Uh, so to ask whether bilaterality, even in an idiopathic case of uh, vein occlusion, it can be central, it can be branch retinal. According to Hare, there is at least 13% of risk in two years that the other eye may get involved. So there can, like in, in this case, because we know there is a systemic uh, comorbid condition, which is uh, a predisposing factor, but in otherwise, otherwise, idiopathic cases where we usually find a probably a hypertension or uh, hypercholesterolemia or probably diabetes, which may have an association, but the other eye risk factors, even if you do not have 
like this cross morbid condition the risk factor is still 13% for two years thank you so much dr devansh uh, so may i ask dr mayank uh, how would you want to investigate uh, such a case so uh, i think the systemic investigations uh, would be very very important over here uh, in addition to what's already been uh, mentioned i would perhaps go ahead with the carotid doppler um i would look for other uh, signs i would be concerned about atherosclerosis or any other vascular phenomena that are happening inside the body so uh, carotid doppler would be very important and i would definitely go for an ecg um and keep the cardiologist and neurologist overall in a group as well uh, given based on the investigations how they show up um these cases would have a high chance of stroke as well as uh, coronary artery disease um so that would definitely be high up on my list uh and angiography definitely would have been uh, useful as well uh from a ophthalmic investigation point of view right so dr kostav has pointed out in the chat that uh, whether the blood transfusion has pre precipitated the impending crv on in the other eye so dr remy you want to comment on that uh per se i don't think the blood transfusion would have precipitated in that rather i would consider the hemodynamic state especially when the hemoglobin was 5 that would have precipitated to this condition and also i would like to add on one more point when you do the investigation especially in this cases the glomerular filtration rate rather than the serum creatinine what is being reported is the glomerular filtration rate which is stated that uh, if it is less than 60 ml per minute as per uh, neha's case it was 9 so it is under a high risk category for the development of a central retinal vein occlusion so the glomerular filtration rate has to be kept in mind when investigating a patient with a renal disease right uh, can i add one more thing sure dr devinsh please come uh, so considering a patient in this case and of course in angiography ideally uh, i would not personally consider but uh, as the patient is already undergoing hemodialysis and that thrice uh, weekly even if we ask the nephrologist they would give the clearance under high risk uh, probably because so frequently the dye means as we know the dye would be excreted out very fast because uh, every alternate day the uh, person would be undergoing a hemodialysis and uh, it's not that our fluorescein which is just 3 ml or in this case we can use in half dose also if required i would personally not Uh, opt for uh, fluorescein uh, as Dr. Mayank was telling, but if required, probably half dose can be done. Uh, there is no contraindication as such. Uh, so, because considering the diagnosis per se, the fluorescein angiography would not reveal much, uh, like an extra point for diagnosis or for the further treatment. So, if required, yes, an angiography can be done. So, Dr. Divyansh, I would. Uh... come again to you regarding uh, probable causes and mechanism of the combined occlusion that we are seeing in the uh, one eye in this patient so what is happening over here it's a back pressure which is causing the ciliorectal artery as we know the ciliorectal artery has a lesser perfusion pressure as compared to a central retinal artery so that's why because of the compartment syndrome or the compartment uh, or the engorgement of the compartment because of the vein occlusion and the back pressure of the vein that is the reason why the ciliorectal artery gets occluded so it's more kind of a spasmodic occlusion rather than an actual thrombus or an embolic occlusion in this case so as uh, in this case the presenter has tried to do an ac paracentesis most most of the papers uh, do not recommend considering as we know very high because the, the possibility of developing only ciliorectal artery occlusion is very rare in, in comparison to a crao it's 0.025% in shields artery and of that also most of the cases of ciliorectal artery occlusion uh, either macular or either foveal involving or not involving has shown uh, improvement after fourth or fifth day because as we know this is not an embolic or not a thrombotic phenomenon which is occurring in most cases but yes in certain cases uh, there can be very rarely a possibility of a thrombus so unless we are clinically identifying uh, embolus at that point and trying to do an paracentesis to move the embolus because the more distal it moves the the lesser the area of occlusion would be uh, so ideally it should be avoided but if we see a thrombus or an embolus then probably trying may help 
in cases where it's uh, it's a combined kind of an occlusion giving anti vegf for steroids would be the plan of management rather than uh, doing an ac parasympathesis right dr mai uh, i would like to... yeah please dr ram yeah. sorry i would like to add a point it's uh, as uh, dr dibe Yes, rightly pointed out. It is because of the raised capillary pressure, which is building up because of the retinal vein occlusion, which causes the intraluminal pressure to increase in the capillary blood. So it is basically a hemodynamic block that happens in the ciliary retinal artery. So AC paracentesis would not help to that extent as in a case of central retinal artery occlusion. That is one point, and an important point to note here is once you control the hemodynamic parameter. like uh, the blood transfusion was given and uh, the hemodynamic status maybe after one more dialysis it was slightly more controlled that the patient the signs of the disease the, the toxicity of the vessels and the degree to which the hemorrhages were there they all increased with the further more hemodialysis probably because in the next visit the first visit he see uh, the patient had lot more hemorrhages than the second visit so basically the hemodynamic status as you improve rather than the lc paracentesis would have worked in the situation that is what i think right can i add a point please dr ne yeah yeah so i think together now uh, with this i think we should also look upon the uh, nocturnal hypotension in these cases where uh, it will also uh, decrease the perfusion uh, of the ciliary retinal artery uh, during the sleep and patient will also not even know what's happening at that point of time because he's sleeping so i think uh, it's good that we know that point and tell the nephrologist that you have to look into the nocturnal hypotension in these patients and they have to have a 24 hour monitoring of uh, blood pressure right so just to add sorry can i can i add one more point please dr dikesh so the uh, the management of ciliary retinal artery the largest series which i could find was from again dr shields article where they have given at least around 15 patients where they had treated with hyperbaric oxygen so but it's not a comparison between hyperbaric oxygen versus observation so most of the patients were given i don't know what uh, and how it would work uh, i have personally uh, no uh, uh, interest or probably i haven't tried i would say uh, hyperbaric oxygen but the studies have eluded that that works better and there are case reports also so we can try that and other than that ocular massage can be done to decrease the pressure you know, that's very difficult to go to a perfusion pressure of a ciliary retinal artery which is much much lower as compared to the ciliary uh, central retinal artery so uh, we can try but better is to do a medical management as uh, dr neha was pointing out to find out other systemic association then as ramya was also mentioning about Okay, Mayank. Uh, since we are talking about paracentesis, so uh, what are your indications for that and uh, uh, timing of paracentesis? Can you comment on that? So, uh, with regards to that, an early presentation within twenty-four uh, hours or so is what I would consider for an AC paracentesis. And uh, yeah, certainly that would be largely the indication in my mind. Right. any other comments from the panel on this okay so let's uh, come, come to the can i, can I yeah, answer the question sure. please the please. question the question is for a ciliary retinal artery am i correct or is it for a central retinal artery uh, no i'll i'm talking in general yeah in cra okay in cr okay. because we've talked about ciliary retinal so okay so yeah. so i would try even at fifth day or seventh day or 12th day probably my cut off this is a random cut off because just to give a benefit of doubt to the patient we know that everything is lost according to the uh, dr harris article after 90 minutes but uh, we have seen that reperfusion can occur in late and there can be some residual uh, uh, vision which may come back so trying uh, because that's the best try which you can give uh, very rarely vitrectomy is indicated but in those cases we should uh, do a, a raster scan over the disc and to identify if we have something which is called a disc plug or you can see that there is some kind of a glyotic tissue or tissue over uh, the disc and at the emergence of a central retinal artery and if we feel that that is maybe one of the reason and the patient understand the pros and cons of the surgery because the clear understanding has to be made uh, to the patient so at our center sir has done around four or five cases of which i have seen only improvement in one uh, 
so it's not that it's a very rewarding surgery yes the patient script that you have done a surgery and then there is no improvement but the explanation is important that this is what maximum we can do so right yeah. and regarding the timing of uh, such a surgery how late time, have you done that the, the difficulty is most of the patients if they present early the first thing we would try to do is conservative management like conservative means the first step the first three steps are decreasing the pressure and doing an ac paracentesis uh, what we follow at our center is a sudden decompression it's not like a gradual you just keep slowly pulling the syringe and then you see the aqueous coming out it has to be suddenly uh, the plunger has to be suddenly pulled so that the the decrease pressure is sudden and that sudden pressure would cause the dislodgement of the emboli is what is expected so that is what we would do and then we would follow up the next patient or the patient the next day and if we see that there is no improvement then probably uh, we have tried uh, but not as the first instance and the patient has presented like 8 hours 10 hours like that so maximum the earliest which we have done is probably one day and uh, the minimum the maximum is probably 3 days the the patient which responded well was the person who presented at one day but he was a one eye so that's why he could identify it early and then present it to us early and that's what again the indication for vitrectomy in his case but other cases were having the other eye which was better so not sure when uh, the indication would be because ideally the earliest but not sure uh, so dr remya uh, what about uh, uh... A combined treatment in terms of uh, using anti-VEGF and steroid therapy in such a case. I would rather. Uh, I mean, anti-VEGF. Uh, this in this patient has to be really used under with caution, with consultation with a nephrologist because he is having an end-stage renal disease. There have been anecdotal reports of uh, renal uh, the the worsening of renal problems with the anti-VEGF injection. And uh, I would not, uh, I mean, uh, you, were you asking about uh, anti-VEGF combined with uh, intermittent steroid? Or? Right, yeah. I would not uh, combine anti-VEGF with intermittent steroid for this case. I would rather suggest uh, intermittent steroid for this case. But again, uh, the injection has to be given under the very, uh, with high want to develop pulmonary edema even with five minutes of uh, lying down position. So they have to be given injection as soon as possible in that position. And then with consultation with the nephrologist, whether she's fit, he or she is fit for injection. So that is what I feel. And okay. I would rather okay. consider an intravenous steroid, otherwise not contraindicated. Dr. Demir, can you repeat your answer uh, regarding the positioning? Your voice was breaking a bit. Sorry, uh, am, I, am I audible? Is it yeah, clear? Yeah, you're, you're audible, yeah. Okay. So uh, I have had a patient who had a, a end stage renal disease. Uh, that was a young patient, and uh, as soon as I was going to give injection, she was died. She was in the lying position for maybe five or seven minutes. At that time, she developed pulmonary edema. So these patients, when you maintain the position in the in the uh, in the lying down position, make sure that the draping your injection doesn't take long time. It has to be done as quickly as possible so that the, the lying down position has to be minimized to how much ever extent possible. So that is a take on the uh, the procedure per se. Otherwise, I would rather prefer an intravitreal steroid in this case, especially in case where there is a uh, co comorbid condition. So I would rather go in for intravitreal steroid in this case. Right. And Otherwise, Dr. no contraindications. Yeah. I had a point uh, before. Yeah, please come in, Dr. May. Yeah. So I completely agree with uh, Dr. Remy. I believe uh, my choice of uh, treatment would definitely be an steroid injection. Uh, atherosclerosis, uh, so basically with an increase in hypertension, there's an increased chance of atherosclerosis, CAD and stroke in these patients. And uh, an anti-VEGF would be a relative contraindication in that case. And uh, in fact, VEGF therapy has been used in some kind of CKDs. So given that, unless there's a very overt contraindication largely due to glaucoma risk factors, we would uh, prefer using a steroid drug. And uh, such patients would also have a lower immunity and have be more prone to infections. So would keep that in mind. Run a pre-anesthetic checkup if possible, inject in the presence of an anesthesiologist. 
just going to add this. Right. Uh, so there's a question by, uh, I'll just take up some questions from the chat. Uh, so Dr. Kostov has asked regarding impending CRBO. So it might be a pertinent question in a bilateral case. Uh, so he wants to know about the consensus for uh, probable treatment of such a case. Maybe we can start with Dr. Divyansh. So, uh, there is a very recent study which is published where it would change our thought processes that the impending CRVO would still require injections and would require continued injections even when the cystoid macular edema is not there. So, the studies are there and they, they have uh, good proof that these kind of cases, if not treated as an impending, would come down later, probably three months, six months or eight months later with the macular edema. But in this case, considering the systemic associations and things like that, in this particular case, otherwise, because right now, after reading that article, my thought process has changed. And because certain cases which I've been following it up uh, for this kind of uh, impending CRVO, have, most of it has turned out to be uh, having a more full-blown vein occlusion three months or six months later. So I would still discuss with them the possibilities of uh, anti -vegit. But yes, again, systemic risk factors and the frequency is still not very well uh, known. So I would probably give every two months is what my thought process is there at this point, because after reading that article, my thought process has really changed. That's right. Dr. Remya, you want to comment on that? Yeah, impending. I truly agree with uh, Dr. Divyansh, but then I would like to add in the systemic uh, the systemic factors that are the impending CRV. So I would give more weightage towards working up the patient and getting the patient worked up by a hematologist regarding what is the cause of an impending CRV uh, because it is not yet full blown. Before treating, I would like to go to systemic investigations. Right. Dr. Mayan? Yeah. So if I understood correctly, uh, we, the, the frequency of injections is uh, what we're looking at, right? Come again? Yeah. We're looking at the frequency of injections. If I understood that correctly. Yeah. I think your voice is breaking a bit. Can you tell me again what you said? So essentially, uh, if I understood the question correctly, I think we're asking for, we're looking at the frequency of injections, right? So with regards to that for the left eye, for example, uh, would it prefer a steroid injection and preferably uh, Okay. Dr. Mike, we are talking about an impending CRO in general. Uh, the consensus of the panel regarding treating, observing. Right. And uh, look at the overall systemic profile, like Dr. Abhay just said. Right, right. Okay, I think we'll move on to our next case. Uh, Please, uh, I'll request everyone to mute their. Just a second, yeah. Okay. So, may, I, uh, may we have the next case ready? I'll just. I'll be muting everyone once and you can unmute himself. Yeah, Dr. Chitrinjan, you can unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yeah, please. Are my slides visible? Yes, they are visible. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting the second case of today's uh, Late Night Retina episode 5. I must acknowledge Dr. Naresar and Dr. Saurav who helped me in this case. Coming to the case proper, my case is a 31-year-old male who is an auto rickshaw driver by profession, complained of sudden onset, painless defectivism for one day duration. There was no systemic history. He was a non-smoker and non-obese. Visual acuity was 6 by 36 in the right eye and 6 by 6 in the left eye. Anterior segment was normal in both the eyes. Coming to the fundus examination, 
there were uh, cells in the anterior phase coming to the retina there were hemorrhages especially in the superior temporal quadrant there were exudates in the posterior pole and we can see vascular sheathing along the inferior temporal vessels and along the nasal vessels also left eye was essentially normal we did the oct we can find out macular edema with subretinal fluid in the right eye left eye was normal we went ahead with the fundus fluorescence angiography we can see uh, two striking features in the ffa one is the vascular leakage another is a late disc leakage why i am pointing these two findings because these two are the uh, findings pointing towards the inflammatory etiology we went ahead with the blood investigations which are essentially normal esr was also normal coming to the evi investigations tpha was negative hi was negative serum homocysteine mantu test and ct test were normal there are no respiratory symptoms eti or any genital ulcers or skin reactions only thing positive was serum ac label which was elevated we came to a provisional diagnosis of right eye idiopathic inflammatory pear view with macular edema we started uh, oral uh, steroids and we planned for a right eye ivt uh, transitional esternoid because macular edema was present patient came to us after around 3 weeks this time the visual acuity decreased further around 4 by 60 less to the rest of the findings remaining normal in the fundus we can find out there is a macular hole rest of the findings become uh, remaining normal in the right eye this is the oct picture where you can find out uh, the macular hole we can find a operculum there is the starting of a posterior vitreous detachment and in the preretinal sp uh, space we can see numerous cells are there uh, dot echoes hyperplasic dot echoes are there so uh, the patient came around after two weeks this time visual acuity was around same 6 by 60 in the right eye rest of the findings were same in both eyes and here uh, the repeat ocd why i am showing oh, we can see, yeah we can see uh, the posterior vitreous detachment is increasing though still it is incomplete it's not a complete one but it is progressing posterior vitreous detachment is progressing we planned and went ahead with right eye macular hole surgery it was a standard 25 gauge uh, pasmal vitrectomy with island filling no flap was done fluid air extend and sr6 injected post operative day 15 patient's visual acuity improved to 6 by 36 we can see in the oct the macular hole closed with remaining subretinal fluid and uh, uh, two months post operatively the visual acuity further improved to 6 by 18 this is the fundus photo we can see the macular hole is closed we can see in the superior temporal quadrant there are sclerous vessels there are uh, residual retinal hemorrhages are present however in the inferior temporal quadrant and in the nasal quadrants there are vascular sheathing uh, this is the uh, repeat oct where we can see the subretinal fluid is further uh, reducing and the macular hole is closed coming to the summary of the case a young healthy uh, young man presented with inflammatory uh, brvo with macular edema which uh, uh, sort which very fast uh, progressed to a macular hole formation the patient was on oral steroids only we had planned for intravitreal tamoxifen esternoid but we did not inject we went ahead with uh, macular hole surgery and successfully the macular hole was closed coming to the discussion the question to the panel is the causes of inflammatory uh, retinal vein occlusion the pathogenesis of macular hole formation in inflammatory macular edema and the management options whether intravitreal steroids or vr surgery if vr surgery what is the timing and if we are planning for conservative management what are the options when we should go for conservative management thank you thank you so much dr chitranjan for your uh, case and uh, it's indeed a very challenging case and my apologies i forgot to introduce you so dr chitranjan is working as a medical officer at arvin i hospital madurai uh, so coming to the discussion part uh, i'll start with dr divyansh so uh, dr divyansh your thoughts on the case in terms of uh, uh, the uh, basic pathology at uh, at here whether it is a primary vein occlusion or something that has been induced by inflammation or vasculitis Uh, so, yeah thank you so the, i would think more in terms of inflammation or vasculitis rather than, than in terms of uh, a vein occlusion considering if we see the uh, the angiography uh, uh, dr chitranjan if you can go to the ffa the yes. first ffa yeah yes. so just just to make people understand that uh, this can be a great mimicker uh, 
so uh, yeah. yeah so as we can see in the angiography in the right lower picture that as we can see the most important part is the disc which is really hot and leaky but other than that what we can see the actual signs which we are seeing in the superior superior temporal area but there are inflammations or the vessels which are leaky in the inferior inferior temporal nasal and also superior nasal organs and if we go to the color photo as we can see that uh, the 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 vessels are uh, so i think in this optos photo it's it's a little difficult i think the second photograph if we if we are able to show that the fall of yeah so as in this case the the vascular sheathing what we can see over here and the blotchy hemorrhages and usually this kind of hard exudates yes uh, a long standing macular edema can have this kind of hard exudates but yes the sheathing as we can see is more important to look for in cases of inflammatory association so for me it's primarily an inflammation or an uh, posterior uveitis which is causing this rather than an vein occlusion so but this is a big mimicker per se to say right thank you dr tikanj uh so dr mayank can you just uh, uh, help us how once again how we'll differentiate these two can you just point it out for us i think largely uh, dr divyansh has covered uh, the points if we were to look at this uh, uh, angiography would perhaps be uh, if you could move to the angiography please so right so yeah so absolutely the perivenous uh, hyperfluorescence uh, that's there along the inferotemporal uh, arcade is one of the most highly suggestive along with of course the suprotemporal arcade and uh, in addition to that uh, um, the very hyperfluorescent disc that is also very suggestive of the uh, inflammatory nature of the disease if it was to be just a um, hypertension related branch atrial vein occlusion we would not be seeing any of these signs so uh, i also want to make a comment on the left eye color photo the optos uh, image that we have so uh, i'm not sure if i'm uh, if i can point out clearly but in the supra temporal periphery would that be any by any chance uh, any kind of hemorrhages or uh, uh, far periphery or is it just an artifact that we are looking no, at no it is artifact actually that my this is artifact uh, so, i have seen it absolutely they should have put a little clearer picture but it is artifact sure sure so uh, in addition to that uh, the phlebitis the the veins being involved the phlebitis aspect as well as the increase in the ace that we are seeing is of course very very uh, suggestive of uh, both the inflammatory nature and perhaps we could look at consider sarcoid as one of the differentials over here and uh, yeah i'm sure systemically and the hrct and the chest uh, investigations that we've run have not pointed towards that but uh, apart from these things what i would like to emphasize also on was uh, the fact that these these cases tend to have a very asymmetric kind of presentation so would want to keep that on a long term follow up as well as well as uh, also look at any chances of vitreous hemorrhage that might be there in the future okay yeah dr ranu yeah add a point yeah please apart from that has been described uh, you need to see for the vitreous cells and the anterior segment also not to forget about the anterior segment and the anterior vitreous space because you will have inflammatory cells and flare and as well as the anterior vitreous space cells in this case and uh, to add up on to what uh, divyansh and uh, uh, mike has told there are two types of phlebitis one is a phlebitis per se which is the non occlusive type and an occlusive type of phlebitis so what is happening here is there is generalized phlebitis and what you can see in the suprotemporal aspect that is an occlusive kind of uh, uh, the vascular sheathing which has happened so that is the only part where in the occlusion has happened rest everything is just a inflammatory component that has been ha happening but then once you started on steroids but then i don't know how it increased in the hemorrhages and led to the development of macular edema and macular hole the hemorrhages seemed to increase to me the second picture 
uh, from the first picture, though he started the patient on steroids, but the hemorrhages has increased. So that means the occlusive component of the disease, though the uh, inflammatory component has come down, the occlusive part of the disease is still ongoing. So that is the reason why the edema has increased and probably that would have caused the macular hole, I guess. Yeah, and in addition to add to that as well, uh, all these exudates that we are seeing, uh, which almost look like a candle wax dipping, you could say, uh, the yellowish exudate uh, along the superior arcade, and uh, yeah, in the OCT, all the vitreous cells that we are picking up, uh, just uh, while the vitreous detachment is occurring, just anterior to it. So all of these signs, also the hemorrhage in the optos picture is not following the midline, like the horizontal midline. So that would be, again, a very uh, suggestive of uh, an inflammatory nature of the disease. Right. So, Dr. Remya, uh, what possible causes uh, can we think about in such a picture? Uh, okay. Inflammatory VRBO. Right. So the most important... Yeah, the most important uh, causes that has been des described in literature for an inflammatory BO BRBO, the most common is the uh, Bechet's disease, then tuberculosis, sarcoidosis very rarely, but then phlebitis can be present in other diseases like pasplanitis or Eels disease, or that is tuberculin hypersensitivity, and also in multiple sclerosis patients per se. But then only uh, vascular occlusion, only in Bechet's TB, most commonly Bechet's TB and sarcoidosis. Right. Dr. Dishvyash, how would you like to work up such a case? So, most of the workups which uh, has been discussed by Dr. Chitranjan is what I would think of. Other than that, probably an uh, HRCT chest is what I would think of. And if not a bronchoalveolar lavage to identify any specific cause behind it. Uh, my first bet would be eels considering the hemorrhages and considering the kind of involvement which is there. So in cases of eels, usually most of the investigations may turn out to be negative. Uh, and But but still, the, this person would require a long-term immunosuppression because at the last visit, we could still see that the areas of uh, evolving vasculitis are still there or those are involving in other areas where, uh, as you can see, even the, in the OCT also, the reflectant, reflectance image of F versus uh, the image of C, we can see that the reflectance of the lower, uh, the inferior temporal area, we can see that hyperreflectivity, which is not very sharp, uh, so that there may be some kind of inflammation around it. So the reflectance image, uh, images can also show this kind of uh, a little fuzzy hyperreflectivity. Uh, so... For me, uh, yes, probably if, even if we are unable to find any specific cause, but yes, in this case, finally, immunosuppression is what I would uh, be thinking of for a very long term. Yes, Dr. Divakan, can I say something? Please, please. Yes, agree, Dr. Divakan. Actually, we again started another course of oral steroids only. In this case, post operatively, though the macular hole was closed, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we started uh, another course of oral steroids. In this case, he's on steroid now. Right, we'll, we'll discuss about this further. Uh, so we have seen a very interesting finding is in this case, like, uh, in terms of the macular hole formation. So Dr. Mayank, uh, can you tell us something about the probable mechanism? And maybe we can also talk about some predictors of uh, this macular hole formation. Yes, so the very likely mechanism in this patient is, of course, the uh, macular edema, which has been very significant. And uh, on the OCT, we're seeing the, uh, you know, disorganized retinal air sign. And uh, apart from that, uh, as the macular edema has probably increased, it's very likely that there's been a deroofing of the fovea with any changing vitreous Nature. So perhaps with an increase, with the injection being given in, that could be perhaps one of the contributory causes. Just the inflammation by itself with the attachment can be one of the cause, but largely around this. Right. Can I add, Dr. Kivaka? Please, 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 please. So there are certain uh, pathogenesis in cases of 
uh, acute vein occlusions which they have mentioned is one the the cystoid degeneration means it's not usually we understand that the cystoid degeneration should occur in the long term cases where the fovea is thinned out and it degrows and causes this but that is one which has been suggested the other one is a sudden uh, hyoid separation as we can see the oct a versus oct b suddenly we are seeing the hyoid is separated and there is a tight adhesion over the temporal edge and at the disc and we can see a posterior hyoid which is separated where we can see the vitreous cells which are not in the oct a so that is one of the reasons which they have commented so there are certain reports which uh, have occurred after anti vegf for after injection in this case uh, injection was planned but there was uh, uh, i think uh, we were unable to give the injection considering uh, the logistic issues so but with the injections uh, it's the decompression or the the form vitreous changing because of either a uh, injection of the anti vegf itself or the ac tap is what has been suggested right coming to the surgical management of this case uh, there's a question in the chat box regarding uh, uh, from dr ritu shah about the timing of the surgery and uh, whether the surgery uh, whether the surgery can be done in an active inflammatory stage so dr ramya do you want to take up that yeah uh in this case particularly since it's an inflammatory we are here so uh, i would rather consider starting immunosuppressive agent first that itself would take part uh, take uh, care of the inflammation part and once the inflammation comes down probably i would take up the patient for surgery but in in particularly when this case is concerned uh, as you can see the second oct and uh, the third oct b and c can see that the macula hole the edges are getting opened up that means the traction is more and you're going to have a larger macula hole if you go if you're going to wait for long so i would rather consider surgery at this stage when i see that the pvd is uh, not complete and the edges are getting rolled out and the macula hole is enlarging i wouldn't uh, consider waiting at this stage i would rather going for surgery at this stage hey, dr chitranjan what was the uh... the status of inflammation at the point uh, you intervened and was it the thought process regarding the uh, prob probability of hole enlarging for intervening at that time the inflammation was reduced uh, because we started on oral steroids so inflammation was reduced and uh, our thought process was as dr ramya told and uh, because there is no consensus why the macular hole is happening but as we could serially Uh, re document the hole formation and the uh, PVD, and as rightly discussed, Doctor Divyan also showed that paper by Doctor Manish Nagpal. Uh, it may be the uh, posterior vitreous detachment that is the sole uh, cause of this hole. So we thought that let's go inside, intervene, and uh, release the traction. That was the motto, and luckily we came out with uh, a close macula for postoperative. Right. Again, just can I add something? Please, Doctor Divyan. So the point of caution is the problem is. the inflammation itself uh, the complications of vitrectomy are high and the complications of peeling so because if we peel in the areas of active inflammation like because uh, i don't know if any one of us have done a vitrectomy in an act, in an acute case or in a case where there is a recurrence and recurrence of vein occlusion or vrv where there are a lot of hemorrhages over the posterior pole and cme so what happens in those cases is the area where we try to peel uh means knowingly or unknowingly we would be peeling in the nfl and more damage would be occurring in the nfl layer so and that would further affect the the contrast and the, the sharpness of the vision uh and, and the scotomas because of that i would say it's very well done surgery commendable job because the uh, none of the complications which are expected has occurred in this but ideal scenario would have been that if we would have intervened when the inflammation is under control but very well done in this case dr ramya you want to say something when you yeah. compare the first photograph with the second and third one you can see that the inferotemporal part where you had active vasculitis previously that has come down so the inflammatory component once the patient is started on the immunosuppressive agent it is it has come down and also the the amount of vitreous cells that you are seeing in OCTB 
the B photograph, it is uh, comparatively, I mean, it is getting reduced by B and D. So that means the inflammation is getting under control. So that is the time when you will have to operate on in these patients, I guess. Hospital Dr. Ramey, probably the third photograph is actually the post photograph, post surgery, I believe. Uh, Dr. Chitranjan, am I correct? Uh, this no, name, the, the ABC. Uh, no, no, the photograph, there. photograph, photograph. Okay, that for, yes, yes, the inferior one. It is post operative. Yes. No, I was talking about the second fundus photograph and the OCT B and C. Yes, B, yes. C and D. These two. Uh, yes, you compare yes. the that we have the cells, uh, the reaction. It is. It's not a post vitrectomized dye because the, the PVD is. So it's not a post-vitrectomized dye. And then you can see that the cells, the number of cells are getting reduced to a large extent. Yes, true, 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 yeah. Dr. Mayank, yeah. I would uh, definitely like to wait for the inflammation to get controlled. Uh, like Dr. Dilbayansh mentioned, uh, I think the chances of bleeding in such cases would be very high. Uh, it's beautifully managed and excellently managed case. Uh, in addition to that, uh, vitreous-based uh, shaving would be very important in such a case because the inflammatory membranes may grow at such an area as well. And uh, uh, apart from that, uh, with regards to controlling the inflammation, uh, my choice of drugs would be definitely steroids and would use uh, immunomodulators in case the patient is either non-responsive uh, or uh, in case he's not able to tolerate the side effects of steroids. And steroids generally tend to work very well in such cases. Right. So Dr. Chitranjan, uh, as Dr. Divyansh has pointed out that uh, such cases can be very challenging and your team has done a very good job in successfully managing it. So any pointers for uh, uh, surgical tips for somebody considering a surgery in uh, an inflamed state? No, no, like as Dr. Devans told correctly, it should be like if you're planning for surgery, uh, it should be done by a very experienced surgeon. That's what I can tell. Like uh, senior surgeon, very experienced, they should do it. If, if at all we are planning for a surgical intervention. Otherwise, whether uh, we should uh, do other managements, that should be on the discussion of the treating physician. But if that is the only one point I can tell, rest of the things are technical things like uh, doing how to do the surgery and all, but it should be done by a very senior. It should not be a kind of uh, novice person who just jumps in and okay, PVD is there, I'll just close the hole like that. And uh, inflammation should be under control. Okay. Right. So Dr. Divyansh, any comments on that, the surgical aspect? So, sorry, so I haven't managed an acute uh, case of uveitis, but as, as I told you, I have managed it cases of acute uh, uh, means a recurrent uh, vein occlusion, non-responsive, and then after many injections, but again, a recurrence where we see the hemorrhages are again propping, uh, uh, propping up. So those cases I've managed. As I told you, the peeling of ILM is difficult and uh, the differentiation of a retinal layer versus an ILM becomes difficult because uh, the hemorrhages, what we see in this case, are in the superficial retina and involving more nerve fiber layer. So, that is much fragile and we can actually tear into the nerve fiber layer. But as we can see in the OCT and the color photograph, absolutely fantastically done. So yeah. I think the credit goes to the surgeon probably. Yeah. So Dr. Bhavik has asked in the chat uh, regarding the role of anti-VEGF uh, as there is inflammatory vein occlusion with edema and has also vasculitis and NVT. Yeah, anybody wants to comment on this, the role of anti-VEGF? Yeah, I would consider uh, anti-VEGF in case there was, uh, so uh, the very, very active uh, neovascularization, I'm uh, still uh, not very certain if that would be, uh, Chitranjan, you would be able to say, was that uh, uh, NVD when you were, you know, having a closer look at both the fundus photo uh, as well, surgically? No, 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 see, uh, like, uh... In the fundus fluorescent, we could see a very like hyper uh, uh, fluorescent, but uh, NVD was not there. Now only, if you are honestly saying, after a close look, I uh, somehow I suspiciously I see it like that, but it was not a NVD. And intraoperatively also, there was not much hemorrhage kind of uh, bleeding kind of thing. 
but yes some kind of uh, hyper hyperemic structure is there over the structure is not really deep per se what i remember i personally prefer a steroid injection but uh, in case there is new vascularization then would perhaps warrant a wedge in my opinion right okay as uh, so dr chitranjan did you consider uh, while uh, operating on this case regarding an intravitreal anti wedge or probably as dr mayank is talking about an uh, a steroid implant as well was that uh, a consideration at that time you are telling uh, intraoperatively that mean at the end of surgery right yes yes so at the end of surgery uh, giving uh, ozodex injection in a vitreoid i is having the similar uh, drug uh, release rate as per uh, uh, with respect to a non vitreoid dye but uh, regarding our still there are kind of uh, conflicting reports some reports say that the d have decreases uh, very significantly so there is no point in giving and our aim was to close the hole so was to make the retina as that means macula as dry as possible and we uh, filled with sf6 so these are the reasons why we did not uh, inject anything Okay, uh, Dr. Chitranjan, maybe you can answer that. Dr. Pradeep Kumar has asked in the chat box regarding uh, why was a dose of forty milligram per day prednisolone chosen? Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, like uh, it should have been sixty or seventy. I, I know that, but somehow our EVA consultant, who have a separate department, so they started with forty. I, I do agree that it should have been sixty. He was a young, healthy person. At least sixty or seventy, it should have been. But again, it was forty. They started with forty. right so i think we have discussed most of the pertinent points here uh, any comments from the panelists before we close uh, this i just want to add in one point uh, some cases of neovascularization due to an inflammatory component that gets taken up i um, mean taken care uh, by the uh, oral steroids or the intravitreal steroids so had it been given earlier provide in the uh, first go the first sitting probably the neovascularization would have been taken care of by the uh, intravitreal steroid and the occlusal component wouldn't have progressed so fast oh uh, agree agree dr remya but uh, probably as we try to uh, kind of uh, investigate very extensively i think uh, that's why some time has elapsed that is the reason probably and by the time he came up with all the investigations and uh, uh, we are planning to inject uh, he developed a macular hole very fast to develop right so probably we'll take up a last question dr kostav has asked uh, where you would do whether you would do where would you do endo laser in such a case uh, there is vasculitis as well as ischemia so did you consider that dr chitranjan Yes, yes. Like uh, there was no NBE per se. Okay, so if NBE would have been there, would have done intraoperatively, uh, done some laser. But uh, we reserved it. If NBE develops or vitreous hemorrhage something develops, we can tackle it postoperatively. That was the thought going on. That's why we did not do it. There were CN barriers on FFA, but there was no active NBE. That's why we did not do the laser. Right. Ah, uh, so I just can I yeah. just comment on this also? Yes, Dr. In an in an active case, probably I would try to avoid the, probably repeating angiography right now when the inflammation is much less, and seeing the CNP areas because uh, as the discussion is because most of the times in an inflammatory case the new ascularization elsewhere is very rare but new ascularization at the disc is more common so there would be CNP areas in the far periphery so in an acute case where you see the hemorrhage and all better not to do laser at that point if a vitrectomy is required do that finish that. and then plan for an angiography post op when once the inflammation is subsided and then plan for a laser yeah, so that that would be better because doing laser when an active hemorrhage is there is there are more complications of laser associated breaks and further complications because of that so better is to avoid that and do an angiography and then plan would be my comment okay.
So I think it's time we close the session. Dr. Mayank, uh, any final comments from you before we close the session? Uh, yeah, I, I think in the chat, I just see that uh, the question of periocular steroids, it's a very interesting question uh, and both points are very valid there. Uh, the infective uh, etiology aspect uh, as well as uh, the effectiveness. Uh, I personally feel that uh, in this, uh, uh, since most of the workup hasn't really revealed anything uh, infective, would perhaps uh, would have considered a periocular steroid a very personal thing. It's a debatable question again. But probably a topic for another another late night session. Uh, so I would like to thank all the speakers and panelists. We had a wonderful session, and uh, most of us are back at work now. So it's still good to see a good participation and a really good discussion. So thank you, everyone, and signing off. See you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.